It is. I'm so stoked for unit testing. Let's do this. Yeah. Fantastic. Because Kyle loves testing. All right. What am I doing right now? I'm pressing the space bar. There we go. Look at that. Perfect gif for this one. That's my face every time that my team says, <clears throat> let's do some more testing on our code. I'm like, sure. Let me go get another cup of coffee. Because I love tests so much when I was in school. Why not outside of school? All right. So let me go ahead and get some things pulled up on my screen before we get going. There's my stuff. One, two. No, keep doing the animation. I like the animation. Do, 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 do. And one more thing. Oh, that's bad programming there. All right. <laughs> oh, excuse me. All right. Sorry, allergies are getting to me this round. It is just a scratchy, eye puffy day. It's amazing, right? Gotta love nature. Are you sure right. you don't have COVID? I hope not. I've had it enough. I'm I've done had with that stuff. once. I'm teasing you though. I uh, no, it's it's a okay. I've also had it once, and once was enough. So yes, I hope it's just very allergies. true. Right, but if anyone feels uncomfortable, I am happy to put a mask on. All right, that's so, funny. <laughs> let's start diving the class here. As always, let's start with some announcements. First things first, as Greg already mentioned, we have assignment one. So remember to turn in those assignment number unos. Um, if you have any issues, feel free to reach out to those colleagues, reach out to your TATFs, reach out to myself. That being said, if you need any additional help. Those slides, the slides that you're seeing right now are on Google Drive. Don't forget about those. If you're looking for them because I said something in the slide but you didn't have time to write it down, we have the Google Drive there. If you lost that link or just cannot find it, direct message me, I'm happy to give you that Google Drive link again. And then finally, if assignment one is just being somewhat of a bear or any of the concepts that we're gonna be going over here and up into the end until graduation, feel free to reach out with, uh, to me and schedule that one-on-one -on -one time on Calendarly. As always, if you don't have that link, direct message me, I'm happy to send it to you. But I am available for one-on-one -on -one help when my schedule and your schedule allows. All right, so those are the announcements we have today. Any final questions, comments, concerns before we move forward? Anything at all. Going once, going twice. Sold to the first question of the day. Okay, so, oh yeah, we had our guest teacher, Bree. So I didn't really to bring this one up, but last, uh, last time in unit two, a student, because we were going over nulls. If you remember in the last lecture, we started talking about nulls. You've all seen nulls before in JavaScript and you're also seeing in Java. Null means nothing, it's a black hole. But again, you know in programming, nothing is still something. That nothingness is called a null. So that being the case, a student asked me, okay, how much space does a null variable actually take up? Does it actually mean nothing? And if so, what's even the point of it? What so about like is, the blood type RH null? I don't believe the computer knows about the blood type RH null, only the concept of null. So in this case, we're only going to be talking about the concept of null here, which is also a keyword. So we're going to take this string, my string, and then the integer, my number null. And we're just going to talk about what exactly this is doing. Let's bring it in our houses. As always, our addresses on our computers are just like homes in a neighborhood. We know that my string null will go and be saved for my string variable here to its own home. Secondly, my number also is equal to null, which will be saved in the same exact reference point. So what's happening here is that if you are curious about how much space a null takes up, a null only truly takes up one area of memory in your computer. AKA if you have a, which for the question by this individual was, if I have a million variables set to null, does that take up any memory? Well, the answer to that is if you have a million variables that are set to null, in the end, it, it will only take up to eight to 16 bytes since that's the, uh, that's the memory allocation for a null in our memory neighborhood. 
So what we are talking about here, and we talked about this before, is that strings and my numbers, we're pointing to this reference. We're pointing to where the house is stored with null in it. This right here, if you ever hear me talk about it, it's called a pointer. We're pointing, that variable is pointing to a specific reference, to a specific address that has the information inside of it. Now, one thing I wanna to talk to you about this is that this pointer also takes up information. So it takes up 32 to 64 bytes. So though we have only one memory allocation for null, if we have a million variables pointing to that one memory reference, well, now we have to multiply a million up to 32 to 64. So if a million times, and let's take the worst case scenario here, 64 bytes, plus now again, the worst case scenario, 16 bytes, Side note, in programming, we always go with the worst case scenario. Do not go for best case because that's how you work on a Saturday. A million times 64 bytes plus 64 bytes equals a whopping 8.0000002 megabytes. That is a lot back in the day because that is only taking up about 12.5 storage on an N64 cartridge. So if you are asking, if you have a million variables pointing to null, how much space does that take up? Well, enough that you can even store it on your N64 device, which I miss N64 so much. So I know this is off the wall and you're like, Kyle, where did this come from? It's like, this is a slide that a student asked for me last time, but I thought it was kind of fun. I like this slide. So I thought it would give it a nice little getting the cogs going kind of thing. All right, any questions about this before we actually dive into the stuff we're supposed to be covering? Nothing at all. All right, well then I'm gonna take this time for a nice call. And let's get going. Sending something only once. Help me out here, create a class variable for a social security number. How would I create a class variable so for a social security number? Who can talk me through it? What do we start with? Class string. Private. Class, very private. good, class variable. So we always start with our accessor, which will be private. Now this class variable for a social security number, we know the social security number will never change. So what keyword do we use when something's never going to change? Final. Final, very good. Remember, it's not gonna be static. Static means that it's only at the class level. Static variables can still change. This final keyword is what keeps it from changing. Now what kind of data type is it gonna be? No. Int. 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 Remember, technically we have Oof. dashes in these in, uh, in these uh, in these numbers. So it would be double string. String. So it's gonna be a string because remember our social security numbers have dashes. They're typically stored with the dashes. So it's actually gonna be a string in this case. But you could also have an argument for an int or a float kind of. But one thing I want to talk to you about is what if just for hy uh, hypothetically, your social security number started with a zero. Say it's zero, one, two, three, just a, the first three, four letters or numbers. If you set that in an int, what would happen is that it would get rid of the first yeah. zero. It would completely get rid of it. It would just bring it to one, two, three. So remember with that when you're storing numbers, if your number starts with a zero, do not store it as an int because it will get rid of that zero, especially if that zero is important. So there's a note right there starting off the, we're just starting with a bunch of good notes inside things, aren't we? Right? Is everyone's mind blown yet, or do we have to keep going? I didn't hear any, any um, explosions. Yeah. Yeah. Can you explain again why it's not static final? It's not static final because static means that it's going to stay consistent over all of the classes. Let's take an example. Say we have a human class. Is every single human going to have the same social security number? No. No. So therefore, we can't make it static because if we made the social security number static in the human class, that means it can only have one value ever for every human ever created. Okay. Very good question. Does that help out, Wima? Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. Any other questions about this? All right, let's keep moving on then. Create a final method variable for the year. For the year, a method variable for the year. Holy cow. 
Okay. What do we start with here? I know I wasn't, I wasn't, we weren't going over this last lecture. Bree was teaching it. So I might be hitting on some things that, that aren't, weren't coming out of my voice originally, but no problem. Let's walk through it. Create a final method variable for the year. This means that we want a variable within our method that will not change because final is going to be there. So if it's a method variable, do we need an accessor? If it's in a method, do we ever put accessors within our methods? Yes. No, we will not put accessors ever within methods. Okay. It's okay, I love the confidence. It's okay, someone told me their answer, so thank you. But the answer is no, we will never do accessors within methods. We'll never do private string whatever in a method. We'll only do that on the class level. Class variables have accessors. Method variables do not. Never, ever, ever in a billion trillion years will they ever have accessors. So real quick, just for everyone's sanity of what I'm talking about, we're in the pet store class from lecture three. To create a class variable, I'm going to say private int num of pets and equal zero. That was a class variable. Down here, I'm going to create number of dogs or dog paws or something like that. Int num of paws or something like that equals four. Now, this is a method variable. In this case, have we ever tried to put private here? Bad things will happen. Though technically we don't get an error, we do not put accessors within the methods. We do not want to do that. So do not put accessors within your methods. Any questions on that? I, I feel like this is a dumb question, but why would it not give you an error if you never do it? Technically, there are very, very side things. Oh, it's probably actually with static is what's happening. I was actually really surprised that I did, did that. Let me try this. Public void foo. Let me try this. Private. I'm still doing it. I absolutely, I think it's because it's a valid keyword, but I don't actually know what the true reason. I think there's side cases that you'd want to, for some reason, have them in there. For the true reason, I have absolutely no idea. So I'm going to be completely transparent. I expected an error to be here. But what I'm saying is that there's no reason for you to try to access variables within methods. That's, that's basically impossible. You can't just access variables within those methods. So do not try to put access to there, mainly because they're unnecessary. But I will look at why we... To... Oh, go ahead. Do you not need the accessor there because the method itself itself has the accessor? Well, that, and also remember, accessors means you can access something. Have we ever tried to access a variable within a method from another method? We haven't, no. because methods no. are doing something and then they return. We only get the value when it returns something from us. So there's no reason to try to access anything inside of a method. Hence, we don't need accessors to begin with. But I'm going to look up, maybe that's a bug. Maybe we just found a bug in Java and we're going to be paid millions of dollars for it. So I'll let you guys know. I'll keep you. I was developing this very trusting relationship with strongly typed languages. And now I just don't know what to think. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm only, what, 15 minutes into the lecture and I completely blew up your entire point of view with this. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> I'm going to look up private and methods, though. That's a really interesting one. End of the story, though. Do not put accessors within methods. They are unnecessary. Especially, or at least for the stuff that we will be doing and anything I've ever done. Never even seen an accessor in a method. That being said, let's come back to this question. Create a final variable met, uh, method variable for the year. What keyword should we start with? It. In. Final method variable. Oh. What keyword should we start with? Final. 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 We should start with final. Because we want to make it sure it's final, it doesn't change. So final, and then you had it right. Int year equals 2020. 
So if we put this around a method, this is what it's going to look like. Apparently I was doing this while it was tax season. Look at that. That makes a lot more sense. <coughs> All right, let's keep going. So this is finals. Setting something only once. We're talking about finals here. Keep a variable constant. Do not let it change. That is what the final does. And that's what I truly want to get across to everyone. When you put final in front of a variable, we can never change it after it has been set to something. This keeps it consistent, constant. The concept of const does not exist in Java. It's all about final. So constants technically do not exist in Java. They're final. So just a small little keyword change there. Any questions on that? Book commented the closest thing to const was something like static final. Is that correct? Technically, yes. Static final would be the closest thing to const. But remember, once you make it static, it can't be, yeah, technically, yeah, that would be the closest thing to const because it would be class specific. So yes, um, that would, that basically says never, ever, Never ever let this change in any capacity, no matter what instance is created. So yes. However, final holds that true weight of not letting something change. Great question. Anything else? Build my cup of water. Oh, there you are. All right. Let's keep going then. Keep hanging in there. All right, grabbing variables in a different way. Let's bring in that dog class. My dog equals new dog Stark. My dog, get my dog's name. There we go, returns Stark. Now, what would this variable look like in the dog class? What would this, knowing what our getter looks like here, remember that's called a getter. Tell me what it would look like inside of the class. Use those comp, you guys are basically human compilers at this point. Compile my code and let me know. What does it start with? Public. Remember, are class variables ever public? Private. Private. Very good. Class variables are always private. Awesome, awesome. Private, and then keep going. What's next? String. String. It's not going to be final. It's not going to be static. We're going to put string there. Very good. And then we say my dog's name, because that's what the getter's name was get my dog's name. We know the variable is going to be called my dog's name from that method name. So there you go, an equals Stark. Now, one thing that I want to show is a dog.diet type returns omnivore. So this one, pretend we made this call in our code. Again, take those compiler minds of yours and tell me, what would this look like in the dog class? Who wants to take a stab at it? Public. I love it. Great start. String. Look at how it's. Uh, uh, look at how it is taken, or look at how it's called. It's a method. It'd be static because it starts with the capital D. Very right? good. Because We're that calling tells us that it's coming from the class. It's coming from the class. Very good. Yes, it should be static. We're calling it directly from the dog class, not from an instance. We're not calling this from dog one, dog two, or Stark, or something lowercase. We're calling it right from the class. Very good call out there. Yes. So it should be static. <clears throat> I also heard final out there. Technically, yeah, you could throw final in here if you want, because the dog will always be an omnivore. So yes, we could have thrown final in there too. We could said public uh, static final. And that would have helped us out there. All right, what else? Can you talk me through it? What else is it going to say here? Uh, get diet type. So it won't, Just, it won't be a, right. remember, these aren't a method because we don't see parentheses here. It doesn't say dot diet type parentheses. So it can't be a method. It's going to so it's gonna be a diet. string, very good. It's yeah. going to be a variable. Very good. String diet type equals omnivore. That's what we're looking at here. So this is what this would look like if we compiled it down into the dog class. Look at that, we're able to see the variable and now transpile it to what it's actually gonna look like in the class. So there we go, any questions about this? I see some faces that are like, Kyle, you're kind of 
kind of irritating me today. Well, what the heck is this? So it's okay, yell at me. Come on, bring it out. Just let it all out. No cursing, please, or otherwise you have to put a dollar in the curse jar. But I will take complaints. Anything. Jason, you look like you're thinking. Give me something. I think this is good. Thank you for doing this, Kyle. You're welcome. I'm happy to puzzle you guys any day. Just let me know. All right. I think I need more of this. More of this? You want more? Yeah. Oh, I got to think of one now. <laughs> I think you're just avoiding unit testing, to be honest. But You okay. are absolutely correct. Yes. Unit testing is like one half slide yeah. away. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, there's unit testing. So it won't okay. ping us if we do static final. It'll just, it'll be okay if we just do static. In the, the second, static? in the second yeah, example. On the last, yeah. Yes. So as long as okay. you have this public static, and you know what, let's go ahead and just implement this real quick inside Thank of you. our DAW class. Yeah. So we have public static here, but what we had was diet type. So I'm going to create that now. So we said public static string diet type equals omnivore, just like that. So we made it public. We made it static. All good. Go over to pet store. And if I wanted to, I would say dog dot and then diet type. <clears throat> Excuse me. I wanted to actually print this out to the screen. I'd say system.out.println, R-I-T-L-N, just like that. I'm going to comment out this stuff just so we don't see it. Do -do -do. Comment out you, and then we're going to run this and we're going to see it. So this is exactly what we just saw, dog.dietype. We're just going to see it out to the screen because I wrapped it in a system.out.println. It's going to take forever because my computer is being slow today. And now we see omnivore is the output. So we're able to access that. If we try to access it through a dog one, technically we can, but that is not the proper way of doing that. And you'll get a warning. You want to access those static variables directly on the class name itself. One thing I want to show you is that this is only accessible because we said public. If we say private for this, we go back, we are going to get an issue here. We see that diet type has the private access in pets.dog, so we're not able to access that. So that's why we're able to do it. I also heard the comment saying final. So public static final. Let's get them right, yeah, right here. We can also do this. Nothing's going to break. And then back to actually, it's probably better to set it to final so no one can change the diet type of dog since it will always be omnivore. So there we go. Any questions about this? Anything at all. All right, let's keep going then. I'm gonna go back to our slides here. All right, bring that static in here because everyone loves it so much. Allows access directly from the class. That's what we have. Static allows access directly from the class. We should never access it through an instance. My dog that diet type. Though you've seen it technically works, do not do it that way. Do not do it that way. You're going to get a warning saying it's an, an improper accessing of that static variable. So please don't do that. All right. That is it. That is it for static and finals. Take a breath. Take a breath. That is it. It's all good. I still feel like I'm angering people here on this Thursday. It's just great. All right. Any final questions before any of this, before we can continue on into the best topic in the whole wide world. Nope, not at all. Where's that thing? Switch into water. Okay, should get more coffee before this, but let's do it anyway. Testing in Java. Welcome to the world of unit testing. Why do we do this to ourselves? That's a great question, Kyle. Let's answer that. Well, we know, and I wasn't able to teach you guys unit testing actually last time, so I'm actually going to do my spiel here on unit testing for this unit. So, though I do not like unit testing, just because, oh, and I got to, yeah, I am missing that. Sorry about that, everybody. I am in, not in the lecture questions channel. There we go. I only have one today. So we have enough room. <laughs> Cody, I apologize. I missed your, I missed your message there. <coughs> 
All right, so let's go ahead and I'm gonna do my spiel real quick on, yes, unit testing. There we go, boop, boop, boop. All right, cool. Though I personally do not like tests because I get test anxiety, unfortunately unit testing is a mandatory or a very, very recommended thing in the programming world. This is because of the one that we already see on here. It can save us from a bad case of the Mondays. This means that humans are programming code. Though computers can be more perfect than people in times and in situations, people program code. People use pencils because they are prone to error. Tests help reduce the amount of error in code. Hence, if we have tests, we can catch those errors much quickly. Therefore, we don't have to come in on a Saturday or come in on a grumpy Monday, getting something from our PM saying everything's broken. Gotta love those days. It also saves us from others having a bad day, meaning that when you write tests about your own code and you send it over to somebody else, they can run their tests. So when they're making their own thing, because remember in programming, you're working in a team setting. You're not going to be programming by yourself. Most likely when you start your first job or whatever job you're doing in development, you're going to be working on a small team or a large team on one code base, whether that's a small code base or a large code base. So if Sally is starting to develop a button, and I just push code that would interact with that button, and I pushed an error there, and I don't run any tests around it, Sally's gonna start writing her code and realize there's a bunch of bugs and get very, very angry at me for writing those bugs and no tests. Hence why unit testing is possible to stop that from happening. I should always write tests around my code to make sure that Sally doesn't have a bad day. So it's not only looking out for myself and being selfish, but also your other teammates. Unit testing keeps the friendship going, or at least the workship. And then finally, tests save us from ourselves. As we're looking back at our code, if I'm continuously trying to update my code or optimize it or something along those lines, and I write, or if I'm not writing any tests, I can easily be prone to errors. Hence, tests are those bumper lanes that keep us in focus of our goal to finish the feature or whatever we're doing successfully. Tests are there to keep us on track. Though they add more time and we have to write them and it doubles our time sometimes, without them, you can easily derail and cost yourself even three to five times more that time trying to fix it. That's why unit testing, though it is a big investment in the beginning, it pays off in the long run. I'm a short-term person and I don't like spending that much time, hence why I'm always nitty gritty to it, but in the end, I understand that in the long term, it is a good investment. So that's why we have these. But the question we should be asking ourselves now is, uh, okay, how do we actually do this? How do we stay on track? How do we stay on the rails? And this is through test-driven development. This is one of the most common ways of writing tests, this methodology in corporate today. So let's go ahead and take an example. Say we wanted to develop a new cat, uh, say we wanted to develop a new cat class. All right, we're gonna do this with TDD right now. We're gonna walk through an example of this, just a very high overview. Step one, we need to write the test for the cat. Before we even create the cat class, write tests for it, create the spec files. So let's go ahead and just say, what does this cat class even have to do? Let's start brainstorming what it's supposed to do. Well, the cat class, it should have a name. Well, it should also have an age. We need a name and an age for our cat at least, and then, we need to let it meow. So just think of this as TDD is almost making a checklist for what you have to do for the cat class. So you have to write these tests, and of course they're all gonna fail, but you know what now what you have to do at a limited sense. So like I said, TDD helps us create a checklist of what we wanna do. When you run your test for the first time, because we haven't even created the cat class, like I said, they're all gonna fail. You're gonna see a lot of red, and it doesn't make for a good morning. But that's where we start to build this cat class. As we begin to build it, say now I have a name, we can check off things off our to-do list. We write our next function, we write our next variable, we check that part off of our to-do list, and then we continue to do this until everything is checked off of our list. This keeps us focused on our main goal, what the cat should actually do, what our class or application should actually do. And in the end, we have a full working code and tests to maintain that into the future. Hence why TDD is so popular. 
that it not only keeps us focused on the goal at hand, but in the end, you're given a set of working code and a set of tests to make sure that code is maintained into the future. Just because you don't want Bob on your team that you know is having a bad Friday and goes into your code and breaks it, and then you have to go fix it. You don't want to do that. Hence why TDD is there to make you a happier person. So again, it does double your time. All right. Any questions on that? Any questions at all? Feel free to write them in the lecture questions channel. If anyone has them. <clears throat> all right, doesn't look like I'm getting anybody typing, so let's keep going. Let's take one of these tests and actually start working on it. Let's go, does the cat have a name? Let's talk about this one. All right. If we're looking at a first te uh, test case here, does the cat have a name? Because this is on our to-do list. We're going to translate that. Does the class variable name get set proper, uh, properly? So does the class variable name, the cat's name, get in, <laughs> retrie be retrieved and set properly? So let's see exactly how we're going to do that. We have our cat, my cat equals new cat Bella. We're writing the test out here. Um, <coughs> excuse me, Katie, to your question, isn't this the same process from Mars Rover? It absolutely is. Yes. We're just going over a second time. You've heard what TDD is. It was just my turn to take the spiel at it. So yes, you are absolutely correct. All right. So yes, cat, my cat equals new cat, Bella. So Bella is the name. That's what we have to do here. So we have to check if this method, my cat dot get my cat's name actually works. So here what we want to talk about is Bella is the name that we need to get back from get my cat's name in order for this test to pass. Bella is the answer. What we call this thing, what we're wanting to come back, praying it comes back so we get a green check mark, is called the expected value. If you don't remember this from the Mars rover, yes, it is called the expected values. What we want returned, what we want returned, theoretically should be returned. It's your theoretical. What, and then we actually run my cat .get my cat's name. What comes back from this method is called the actual. What is true reality? Your expected is your theoretical, your hypothesis. Your actual is what's in true reality, what's actually should be coming, or what actually is coming back. Those are two very important concepts because your expected should always be defined as the expected in your test and your actual should be truly running the method. If they ever get intertwined, your test immediately becomes, say, untrustworthy. So remember that. So that being said, Expected equals actual. That's what we need to check. But how do we actually do that in Java? <clears throat> well, this might come to a surprise, but we're gonna be doing kind of what we were doing in JavaScript. We're gonna be doing a thing called assert equals. That is our method name for our J unit, what we're gonna be working with. J unit is our testing suite. On the left-hand side of the equals, we have expected. And on the right-hand side, we put our actual. This method will check to see if expected is equal to actual. Do all that fancy work for us. That is how we write our test. We're going to place this now inside of its own method. Every test will go inside of its own method. Public void cat's name gets set. So we're seeing if our cat's name actually gets set through the constructor. Now, take a close look at this. Beautiful test, right? Everyone's happy. He's like, wow, this doesn't look too bad. All right, all right. We're missing one more thing. And it's one thing you got introduced in the last lecture. It's something very, very specific to Java. It's called an annotation. You saw the annotation last lecture called override. At sign override to override those methods. In this case, we're going to add a different annotation for the test. That annotation is at test. Remember, these yellow things here with that at symbol, annotation. Annotation are not going anywhere. In, any, in fact, they are slowly going to grow on us until they take over. So remember your annotations. 
All right. What about the Delta? Ryan, can you elaborate a little bit on the Delta? Oh, oh yeah, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the Delta I think is taken away in the newer versions of JUnit. Technically you can put the, the Delta there as like, I think they say 0 0.001 or something like that for numerical values. Um, but yeah, honestly, I never use the Delta. Sorry about the background. It's been an extra busy day for St. Louis. Uh, I don't believe you have to include a Delta for strings, but we're gonna, we'll, we'll double check when we're doing our example today. So yeah, let's see. I always forget that about that Delta because I never use Delta in my own tests. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I thought that was deprecated. I want to say it's deprecated. I'm gonna double check that. So I came up last unit. Delta deprecated, question mark. Cool. All right, great question. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Like it just spawned in my head. All right, like we said, this is called an annotation, an annotation. So that at sign depicts that. So take a close look at that. All right, let's make sure we got it. Go ahead and talk to me. Talk to me, talk to me. Let's make sure we got it. An annotation always begins with what symbol? As I basically, uh, what was it? Uh, at, uh, at symbol. Uh, uh, at. Next question. And goes where on the method? Above, before, the top. Above. The top, above. Delta, um, delta is the current form right now. Okay, awesome. You know what I'm saying? Awesome. It's the one that's causing all the cases to increase. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so for deltas, if anyone is also curious about the delta in the assert equals, what the delta means is the difference between the uh, actual and the expected, how much it can be plus or minus. Now, I did want to put that out there in case anyone's like, what exactly is this delta thing? But you are absolutely correct. It goes above the method. Yes, above the method. All right. A test method always has the accessor what? Sir, what, you, private. what is the accessor of a test method? Test? Like, so remember, what are accessors? What are our options here? What is an accessor? Public, private. Public, public private, public. protected. What is our tests? Public. public. Very good. Public. They're going to be always public. A test method will always be public. All right. And it will always have the return type what? Void. Void. Very good. It will always have the return type void. Awesome job. So a test method will always be public and it will always return void. It will never return anything else. All right. A variable that stays constant will have the keyword what? Static. We're not looking for static. Static means something different. It's going to stay only on the class and uh, the class. Uh, the class data level, what means it's never going to change? Final. 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 Good. Final. If you put static in front of a variable, it can still change. That's not going to stop it. Final is the one that pumps the brakes. Once you put final in front of a variable, it cannot change. So make sure we see the difference between that. Static and final are two different concepts. Final keeps it from changing. Static keeps it at the class data level. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any questions about that? All right. We sure we got it? Give me a pop quiz at the end. Yeah? No? All right. Whew. Let's take a deep breath then. Let's do some fun stuff. What's a group of kittens called? Kindle. Kindle? Binding? Anybody? Anybody yeah. got it? Buster. It is actually a Kindle. It is a Kindle. Very good. I heard someone say Kindle. All right. We're talking about cats all day today. Cats can jump up to how high of their height? Four times their height? Six times their height? Eight times their height? I honestly forgot to put the slide in here. Six times. Six times. It is actually six times. Who looked through this? Someone cheating. Don't download those slides. All right. How many toes does a cat have? Fourteen. Fourteen. Finally, I got you on one. It was 18. They actually have 18 toes. I think it was like six in the back. I forgot what it was, actually, the math. I don't remember. But um, Five on somebody, the front feet, four on the back feet. 
Is that what it is? Dude, okay. it's got yes. those little demon claw things. <laughs> demon claws, my I love it. Friends, my oh, friend's cat has be... extra toes. I've heard that's actually very, like, cat? nearly common. Oh, yeah. Cats have extra toes oh, now. Yeah, they're so cute. Little toe beans. And have on each paw. I love it. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, is everyone happier now? Polydactyli is actually the right polydactyly is actually very common in cats it's about the same amount of how common syndactyly is in humans like syndactyly meaning web toes huh. nice nice all right i'm getting a bunch of facts today i love it all right we all good now everyone happier like kyle you gave me some cat facts now i'm your, i'm your friend again i'm your buddy no but I still see some people who are just like, just stop it. Kyle, just give me the facts. I'm like, fine. Let's keep going then. Apparently, we can't have any fun today. Let's talk about setting up tests. Thank you. Let's talk about setting up tests here. So we talked about TDD, and we talked about the cat's name, the cat's age, and wanting it to meow. So let's go ahead and talk about these tests actually being set up here. Our tests go in a single suite. If we're gonna be testing the cat class, just like you did it in JavaScript, you're gonna put it all in one class, the cat, cat test dot spec or something like that. We'll go into more of those examples here later in class, but we're gonna be just doing the cat test class. These are examples of those particular tasks, uh, those, <laughs> those tests. Now pay close attention to one thing I really wanna point out here. We create a new instance of a cat in every test. This is a good standard to do so. Because if you manipulate the cat class in any of these tests, they will immediately boil over to the next. So make sure that you're creating individual instances of these cats or whatever you're testing between each test. This will help you out and keep you from causing any issues. I will warn you that there are situations that you will want to create a class variable for the cat to test. But you need to wait for that situation to arise before you do so. By default, we should be creating our own instances of cat for every single test. As you work with tests, you'll notice what I'm talking about of when to actually create individual cats and when to actually put them inside of a class variable so everyone can use them. I see a question being typed here, so I will give it a second. Should each instance be the same? That depends on what your test is testing. Say for the first one, we want to see if Bella gets set and we test that. Maybe for the second test, we want to see if nothing gets set if we just pass it empty parameters. So it depends on what you want to test inside of there. Great question. Remember, if we have maybe multiple constructors, we have to write for a test for each of those constructors. So no, your instances might not always be the same. I see one more person typing, then we'll move forward. Are you mentioning this so we don't go in the habit of using at before? That is correct, which we'll talk about here that in a, just a moment. So with these individual instances, maybe for some reason you do actually want to reduce the amount of code that you have inside of here. Maybe you do want to create a new instance every single time. Let's go ahead and dive into what that means. If you wanted to actually create a class variable for my cat and you want to re-instantialize uh, re it every single time, that, Chris, is where we're going to bring in the at before annotation. The at before annotation will run every single time before a test. Before a test. So before the test runs, this function will run. Now, there are a few in the new versions of JUnit, and I'm going off of some older stuff, so I apologize, but there are also the before eaches and before alls as well, depending on the version. We'll go explore exactly what we have there, because I forgot what's exactly in this version. But the biggest thing to take away is before means it's going to run before the test. I got the question, is there a specific way that you should group or divide up your tests? There are, in some cases, and um, essentially to help you out from a structural standpoint, starting with the constructors first and then going into the getters and setters and then the, all the other methods could be a common way of doing it. 
So working your way down and then into the edge cases. So you could do it that way. So you can divvy it up by functionality is kind of what I'm getting at. So depending on what's inside of the class, divvy it up so you know exactly what's in each section. So that being the case, if the, the, fun, uh, the class has to do one thing, one thing only, you can put a suite around that. But if it does two different functions, divvy it up amongst that. So I don't really have a good one because for J JavaScript, there's a better way to do it with describes and contexts and its and all that. With JUnit, you kind of want to just place it into those specific functions. I guess I'm um, thinking more like, would you break each of those up into like different files? Typically, we want to keep everything within one file of the class that it's testing. So if you're testing the cat class, keep it in the cat test file or the cat test class. How it just seems like Java has so many more files than JavaScript did. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> It does have more because everything has to be a class. So it does have the, the possibility of being a, a very large application. Yes, <laughs> you are, that's a, yeah, a great thing to notice. Uh, does that help out your question, Katie? Okay. Can my cat be used in a test case? Yes, my cat can be used in a test case. As we can see here, my, uh, and you might elaborate a little bit more, but yes, you can. You should definitely be using my cat or the instance that you're creating inside those tests. Ryan, can you set up the instance in the before and then alter it if further, alter if further per unit test? Um, yeah. If I mean, if you just set it up within the before statement, technically you can alter it whatever you like in the other tests because it will be reinstantialized before every test. So you can do whatever you want to it. That's kind of why we do the before tag here. So technically that would work. Um, let me know if I didn't really get at your question though. No, that was good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And then Amy, I'm sorry. Um, do you have any questions about the unit testing? All right, so in that case, what we're gonna do is that we're gonna talk about one more thing. So we did before, can anybody guess what the next thing is going to be? It's going to be, After. okay, so we have, our, very good, absolutely. After. So we have heard before here, we're setting up our cat test. Take a very close look at what this method looks like. We have public void set up cat test here. And then we set up our instance of our cat. We say this because we're using global variables. We should always, or sorry, excuse me, class variables. Should be using these class variables within a test. We'll see this in an actual exercise here in a moment. And then of course we use scanner or something like that. We're doing scanner here because remember scanners have to be closed. We have to open up a scanner and then we have to close it. So we created a new scanner here, but we have to tear it down. Why do we have to tear it down you ask? Because the thing is called memory leaks. Memory leaks are when something isn't closed down and your application consistently keeps it around, puts it in the back corner and starts, oh, what is that called? Uh, hoarding it, it hoards all that information to the point where it just gets overran with itself. So your application can actually keep data around and build upon itself until it literally crashes itself or your computer. That is called a memory leak. So you don't wanna do that. So please close your scanners. And to do that after a test, what we, gotta, what we need to do is use that at after annotation. So at, after, at after annotation is what we use to run after a test. So that's what our annotations are. So let's go ahead and quickly review. Remember to create a test, what annotation do we have to use? At test. At very test. good. And at when test. we want to, very, very good. At test, yes. And if we wanted mm -hmm. something to run before our test, what do we run? At before. At before. At before. At before. At before. Right, it's right on the screen. Isn't that easy enough? And then, of course, you know the final one. If we want to tear down stuff, what annotation do we use in our tests? After. Very good. All right. Just for that, because you guys answered so well, you won the bonus. We're going to do an example. Isn't that great? So yes. do you, yeah. Can I ask a question real quick? Yes, please do while we're getting ready. What's up? So do you do an at before and an at after? 
between each test or can you run like one at before have multiple tests and then an at after um so you're talking about can you put like a before below a test like a before test 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 after typically that would be the setup that's what you want to do but okay. uh, maybe I'm, I'm not i was making sure you wouldn't do like before test after before test after oh no so what it's going to do is compile your class and it's going to run all of your before annotations no matter where they're placed then run your test annotations no matter where they're placed and then your after ones very good question yeah it does not matter on placement Kyle, I have a, a question real quick about the scanner. Yeah, what's up? Uh, we were doing scanner variable name equals new scanner, just like we do class variable name equals new class. But in the um, the other slide, you have this dot scanner equals new scanner. So that would be cat scanner equals new scanner. How does that, if they're not in the same class, how does that work? So they would be. So we use this dot when it's a class variable. So what this is dictating is that there's a class variable up there called scanner lowercase. So that's what this is depicting right here. I use scanner as an example, just because I know I needed an after tag to close it down. So that's kind of why I'm using scanner here. But mentally note that in this cat test class, there is a scanner class as a class variable. Does that make sense? Or did I use the word class too many times in that, in that explanation uh, it didn't make sense but but no, 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 i okay. will look at it later <laughs> <laughs> let me i'm gonna go ahead and include the scanner inside of our example so i can try to talk through it a little bit more now i just got to remember why in the heck that is not showing my actual project uh, what are you doing why are you like this What did I press? Press something weird. Kyle, are you having a PebCAC error? Oh, uh, a what? <laughs> a PebCAC error. What is that? Problem exists between chair and keyboard. Oh, um, maybe. Is that? <laughs> is that? Sorry, I'm like I'm debugging my own problem right now. That's chair. Chair. What's between the chair and wow. keyboard, Kyle? <laughs> I love it, Jason. Oh my gosh. Awesome. Why you you I'm trying to fix something right now, Jason. You're <laughs> I'm over capacity right now. I'm that the joke goes like right over my head. All right, tell That's me the answer. Awesome. Make me feel dumb. Memory leak. Oh my I'm how do I disconnect somebody? <laughs> <laughs> my gosh. All right. Where okay, come on. Why is my view? Anybody, any TAs on the call remember how to fix my view? for IntelliJ. It's not doing it correct. Of course not. Next structure, IntelliJ. You have to do all depth one now. Okay. You are just being no fun today. All right, give me a second here. Okay, control. Nope. All right. Awesome, awesome. Let's go ahead and we're just gonna have to do this the old fashioned way. So is my code. Oh, here we go. Trans project structure. Oh, okay, fine. What we're going to have here is project files. Is that where you are? <laughs> you would do this to me right now. All right, what we're going to do here, and I feel bad because I want to actually show you guys what you would see on your IntelliJ, and I'm trying to fix my view right now. No. That's not it. That's not it either. <sighs> um, is that it? 
No, because I need source in there. Oh my gosh. Okay, maybe it's under view mode. Oh, 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 nope, nope, I didn't do it. View mode. No, 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 no. Love doing this on the fly. Show members, show modules. If you click on packages and then click on files, won't you be able to project files, third option down? Uh, this one right here? Yeah, third one down, project packages, project files. Yeah, I'm not getting everything. Able to... Yeah, I'm not getting everything I need to see. Oh, you know what? No, no, no. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, I don't know why that didn't show up. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, under source. But I'm wondering why this is all orange now. You know what? You guys are going to see the fun thing. I am closing out because I feel like I broke stuff. So we're just going to do a little extra here again. I'm going to continue to break stuff. All right. All right, whatever. We're going to see if it actually works. So what I'm going to do is press new, and then I'm going to cre create a directory called lib. So for our testing units, just like you had in JavaScript, we're going to have a thing, basically libraries. You remember the concept of NPM in JavaScript, correct? NPM was our node package manager that brought in different code that other developers have made into our own project. In Java, unfortunately, we don't have a cool NPM like that. We have a thing called jar files. Jar files are our libs, are our libraries that we use to do extra stuff stuff inside of our projects. So that is what we're going to be working with. That's also what I wanted. Today's just full of things I don't want right now. There we go. And what I need to do is that I am going to, and that, there we go. Go into my developer and you should already have been giving these two. It's going to be a J unit and this ham crest. I'm going to bring it into lib. There we go. So now we have two of these. So once we have a little lib folder, which I created manually, we have our two jar files in there. What I'm going to do is right click and I'm going to say add as library. Say press OK. And I'm going to do it for this one as well. Add as library. And press OK. That will bring JUnit into my project. Awesome. That's what we want to do. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go into our source. And what we want to do here is we're going to create a new directory. What do I want? No, I want. It's been a second too since I did JUnit. So we're going to have to. Yeah, that's what I, I knew it. I knew this was what was actually happening. Not really. Wish I did. All right. We are doing something even better. There you go. New project. Click next. My project module has got all mixed up and I am, I'm not going to waste your guys' time with showing you or with uh, going through all that. So I'm going to create a new project real quick. There we go. Now everything's back. It's blue. All right. New for, uh, uh, package. I'm going to create cat. Oh, sorry. We need to refactor that, rename that. We're going to be pets. Not our class name. So we created a package called pets. What we're going to do now is right click new, click Java class, we're going to call it cat. There we go. We have a cat class. We're going to create things for this cat class so we can actually test it. Inside of source also, we're going to create a new uh, package here. We're going to call it tests. There we go. Now we're going to create new Java class and we're going to call it cat tests. Now, <clears throat> I just started a new project. I know we did the lib example. But that was for lecture three for the lecture five application. We're going to do it again. I know, I know I'm going to bore you here, but we're going to create a directory. Ooh, pop quiz. What was it called again that we're going to put everything in? Lib. Very lib. good. All right. Thank you. Still listening to me. And, and then let's go to lecture five. Is that short for library? Lib it is, yes. So, Kyle, uh, that problem you just had, that's not unfamiliar as far as not knowing what just happened. Can you summarize what the problem was just there, just in case we run into that? Yeah, so what you just saw were all of my, I'm gonna try to find, actually three here, three, uh, like three. So what I saw in there is that I was trying to mess with things beforehand, um, and I kind of messed up my modules. So if you look at the recording, I had all orange folders there, 
those orange folders are saying those are externals, meaning that m somehow my folder structure got completely messed up there. If you see orange on your source, that is not a good color for that. It should always be blue, how we see it here. So why I, knew there's a, why I know there's a problem is because my source was not blue and my entire structure was just absolutely messed up. So I threw my hands up. I was like, I can't, we don't have time to re-engineer re all of that folder structure, which is possible. If that ever happens, reach out to your TATF to help you out with that. But that's what the problem was. Let me see T U R E. I know that didn't really offer too much clarity about what was actually going on, but I the the fact is is that I don't exactly know what caused it when I was going through stuff. So no clear understanding why file. Kind of love live demos today. You know what we're gonna do that. I'm hoping I actually get to do an example with you guys. Otherwise, I apologize. Reopen lecture three. New window. All right. Give me back my libs, please. Oh, you're going to be like that? Yeah, there you go. How do you like that? If you're ever wondering, yes, I do yell at my computer most of the day. All right, we have our lib folder here. I have a copy of our JUnit and our Hamcrest jar files. I'm gonna drag and drop those now into the lib, just like we did before. You are just the worst today, thank you. All right, there we go. I added them to my lib folder. As you saw, it was still trying to index stuff. I said, fine, and I immediately did it again. I just caught IntelliJ at a, at a bad time because apparently we're on IntelliJ's time right now. All right, again, we can right click and press add as library, press okay. Same thing with the J unit, right click, add as library, press okay. There we go. And after 15 minutes of pure stress, we have our testing structure in place. Isn't that great? Look at Kyle being, having his life together today. All right, so we have our cat tests. Let's go ahead and start writing things. Tell me this, just to test this out, <laughs> pun intended. <clears throat> How do we begin writing our tests? What's the annotation thing that we're gonna be using? At test. At test. Cool, and what should we test first about our cat? Someone give me something to test. Name, name. Void. Void, all right, what do you guys want to test? Test name. Name. Test cat's name gets set. There we go, I love it, all right. So the first thing is first, what we have to do is, well, we'll just talk you through it. We have to create a cat, and say cat equals new cat. What we have here is we're going to say Bella, like we always do. And what we're going to do is that we're going to say cat dot get cats. Uh, oh, we'll say get name because we're going to make it easy there. And then we say assert equals expected and actual. Now we have a few things missing here. So let's go ahead and go through all of it. We need an expected and actual value. We need to create a new variable here that says string. Now, is this one, the one I'm just gonna straight type Bella, gonna be our actual or expected value? What should I name this variable? It's expected. 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 Very good, expected, awesome job. Yes, expected. There we go, have we expected, and what should be our actual? What is actual again? Get cat name. Very good, what's returned from the method that we're testing? Awesome job, yes, string actual. There we go. Now let's go ahead and make sure, is it asserts for this one? Uh, let's make sure. it, right? We do, but I always forgot what it's actually supposed to be, JUnit testing. Da, 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 da. It's gonna be assert equals. Isn't it? Yeah. I thought it said assert equals, but 
that no, that stuff was coming. Assert, uh, I think it's the what is that? An asterisk, yeah, it, I think. It's um oh, if there's a TA on the line, that'd be really helpful because I think this is the version that doesn't have asserts, and that's what I'm. Uh -huh. There's there's two ways to do asserts, and let, maybe it is actually assert asserts equals. Oh, that's right. I think assert equals we have to. There we go. There it is. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. It was. It's a. It's a really. It's a tricky one to import. I apologize. It is a cert equals, but yeah. Okay, so for the recording and for all of your for all of your stress in the future, look at what this is doing. You have to import static and then the assert equals. This is a very tricky one, and sometimes IntelliJ doesn't help you out with it. I've seen a lot of problems in the past with this, so take note that this is how you import assert equals here. All right. So we have a cert equals now, that looks good. We have our actual or expected, but we're still getting red. We have this cat and get name. We can fix cat, that means it's just not imported. So we're gonna just highlight over it. If you wanna do that maybe, no, you don't wanna do that. There we go, import class, you just import the cat. We got our cat in there. But now take a close look. Expected zero argument, arguments, but found one. What does this mean? What do we have to do to our cat class? Make the um, test method. We already created the test. What do we have to do to the cat class? Put the method in there. The parameter. The certain kind of method. What's our first thing we should do? Look, what is this called? Who can remind me what this particular part is called? It starts with a C. Variable. Not a variable. It starts with a C. Constructor. Constructor. It's the constructor. Constructor. Very good. The constructor creates the instance of the cat class, of any class. So what do we need to do to our cat class? What do we need to build? The constructor. Very good, the constructor, awesome. So whoever just answered that, Katie, I'm gonna pick on you right now. How do I build the constructor? <laughs> what am I gonna do first? Uh, Cue Jeopardy music. Yeah, I'd fail this Jeopardy. Access. <laughs> Katie, the uh, access uh, public. Very good. Yes, public. Awesome. Awesome. All right. What comes next? Keep going. Static. Do yeah. constructors ever have return types? Do they ever have statics or finals? Void. Last name. Void. No return types. Well, it it is returning Void. a specific Void. type. It's technically building. I wouldn't say returning. Let's say building, yeah. building an instance. But public, and then we're not gonna put any other kind of keywords. We put cat. We put the name of the class. How we build the constructor in Java. That is how we begin with our no argument constructor right there. Now, taking a look at cat tests, we're passing in Bella here into our constructor. So to make that stop yelling at us, what do we need to do over here? Total cat. Create the parameter. No, for the parameter, we need to tell that it's gonna be a string parameter. Awesome job, I heard it. I heard it a few times now. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, what kind of parameter are we taking in? What do we put here to build a parameter? String. String, string. very good. We put the data type, awesome job. Yes, string. And then what do we wanna call it? Give me something arbitrary. S name. Cat name. Cat name, we'll just say cat name, awesome. All right, cat name. We have begun. Look at that, and I come back here, and oh, our error is gone. We're well on our way to taking that early lunch. Awesome, all right, next thing we need to do here. Oh, we have the constructor, so it but shows we, it to you without even running it. Exactly, it will take away those errors, yes. Absolutely, that's why TDD is so nice. It will slowly take those errors away until you can actually run it and try it. We're still getting this error down here that says oh. get cat name. What is this thing called again? Getter. A getter, very good, absolutely. So we have a getter down here. What do we need to do here to start creating that getter? This. This. Is this, okay. I. What is it? Um, it's. We say cat name, that's fine. Is equal to. Is equal to. Equal to Bella, right? Equals cat name. 
equal equals cat, equals name. cat, cat name. name. Very good. Cat yes, name. because it's what's being passed into the parameter. We need to set that to our class variable. Which leads me to my next question. We're getting this error here. It says cannot find symbol of cat name. What does this mean, and what do we have to do? Does cat equals cat name? Well, we have to actually. The code is absolutely correct. We're missing something. What are we missing? Oh, we have to tell it about the variable. We have to define the variable above, or type the variable above. Yeah. Very good. We have to create the class variable. Fantastic. We have to create the class variable up here. Remember, class variables, constructors, methods. That's how our classes are constructed. So someone talk me through of how to create this class variable for cat name. What do we start with? Private. Private. Very good. Private. All right, keep going. Private string. String. Awesome. And then cat name. Awesome, awesome. Look at that. We have completed our constructor setting that class variable. So our information is flowing in. But if we go back to cat tests, we still aren't letting that information flow out. So that being said, we still need to do this getter thing. So how, coming back over to cat class, how do I do this getter thing? What am I going to do? Class method. Setting the getter. Talk me through it. How do I create a getter? Shortcut method, right click. Get, oh, get name. Public void. We're going to create it manually. I heard someone trying to talk me through how to do it through IntelliJ to autofill it, but we're going to do it manually. So what do I start with? Uh, public. public. Very good, public. Uh, string. Very good, because we're going to return something. We're going to return the information. Very good, string. And then what? what is a getter always start with? As I almost get, mentioned. The, get. Very good, get. exactly. Get cat, cat name. name. Awesome. Do we take in any parameters inside of a getter? Return? Uh, no. Not inside of the getter. Not inside. not inside of a getter, never. Very good. No, return and then return. what do we return? Yes. <laughs> this dot yes. cat name. Dot cat name. Very cat name. good, everyone. This is a getter right here. Awesome job. We see we're getting this error over here. What do we need to change? I thought for the getter you just did I didn't think it was this dot for the getter. I thought that this dot was for your setter. So if we ever need to interact at all with our class variables up here, if we use this. So our, our getter gets the class variable and our setter sets the class variable. So both of them will actually use this. In your readings though, it looks, they don't have this. Even this is technically optional. I put this on there. I know I apologize. I put this on there when wherever we're interacting with class variables to show that's what we're doing. So if you want for your benefit, I'll take this out just so we keep sanity <laughs> inside the classroom. All right, but we are still getting this error over here. What need needs to change? To change? The method name. Very good, Caleb. Yes, absolutely. We need to say get cat name. Eureka, we have our test created. It's in the house, I know that. Okay. All right. So we have our test created. Now, who wants to run it? We want to run it? Maybe? Kind of? Nah. nah, yeah. All right, class is out. I'm scared. All right, let's go ahead and run it. So we have two options here. We have a single green arrow next to the test. This will only run the individual test. And then we have this double arrow up here. As you build more tests in this testing suite, the double arrow means it will run all of them within cat tests. So double arrow will run all the cat tests, a single arrow run that individual one. Let's go ahead and click on this one because there's just one test. And let's see what happens. It's gonna build, it's gonna do things, it's gonna take too long. And look at that, that beautiful green check mark that we all strive for. It's right there. So our cat test has passed. <clears throat> now let's watch it fail. Maybe I want you to put an exclamation point uh, next to my cat name for whatever reason. Maybe three exclamation points. Let's go ahead and rerun this and see what happens now. Let's go ahead and see a failing test. It's gonna build again, it's gonna parse. And now we see we have a test failed. This is what a failing test looks like. Take a close look. Expected was Bello with three exclamation points, but we only got our actual. When this happens, we have to now understand, okay, do I want to fix the code or fix the tests? 
typically you want to stay away from fixing the tests. If the test is failing, that means, okay, something in the code is broken. Let me go over to the code. So what it wants me to do, and also don't do this for your getters, is add three exclamation points or something like that. And run that. Once we update our code for whatever reason, we get back here and now it's a good old green. Look at that. Awesome, awesome. So that is an example of our cat tests. Now, real quick, because I know I promised this and we're running a little out of time, is that we said we are going to build class variables within our tests. So let's go ahead and do that. Class variables are always private, test or not. So we have first a cat in here. Cat, or we said, mm, yeah, we just said cat equals new cat. Or we can just do this actually, if you wanted to. And then for the other example, just for uh, sanity sake too, I'm gonna put in scanner here, let's say scanner. Awesome. And I'm gonna import scanner too. All right, now if I wanna go ahead and instead of using this right here, and I just wanna, <coughs> excuse me, use cat and this.cat. If I ran this right now, let's go ahead and see it. I'm gonna get a failing test because I am not doing anything. If it even, yeah, I'm gonna get a bunch of errors back. This is not correct because I am not instantializing the cat's name to anything. I'm not instantializing it to, uh, to Bella. So before my test, I need to actually instantialize my cat object into Bella. So what annotation am I gonna use and what method I'm gonna build here to do this? What tag? Before. Very good, before. We wanna build it before, awesome. So we say before. We say public void uh, before cat tests. There we go. In this one, we're gonna say this.cat equals new cat, and we're gonna put in Bella here. Additionally, like I said, we wanna do this.scanner equals new scanner. Let's just say we need a test with the scanner or something like that. Oh, I need to do system.in. There we go. All right, let's go ahead and run this and let's see now if we work. Awesome job, our tests are passing, everything's okay. But hypothetically, again, if we need to use a scanner in one of our tests, we don't want those memory leaks, right? Again, Jason apologized for that joke going right over there. <laughs> we don't want our computer to blow up from our memory leaks that we just discovered. We need to tear down that scanner at the end of our tests. What annotation are we gonna use for that? After. After. after, awesome job. So we say after. Public void after cat test. Some, there we go. And what we do is we say this.scanner.close. Cool, cool. We run this again, make sure it works. <clears throat> and there we go. We have a before a test and an after all created for us. So this is an example of unit testing in Java and how we can do it to start creating basically those bumper lanes again for classes that we're gonna create into the future. So with five minutes left here in class, I'm gonna open it up for any kind of questions or anything else that you guys would like to see before I turn it over to you. Brian, I have a question. Yeah, please. Uh, like if we uh, wanna write uh, one more test and uh, and we already said that before, and in that case, we don't need to create the new instance, right? In that case, right? Correct, absolutely correct, yep. Okay. So you can create as many tests as you want. It's and all if, Yeah, if we said that before, and we don't need to create the instance in any test, right? Say that one more time. Like uh, before in this test, the test cat name get set, right? So before uh, before using the before annotation, we uh, created an instance in this test, right? Correct, I believe so, yep. And after the before, um, we created the before annotation and we, we removed the instance from here, right? Remove the instance. Do you say remove the I instance? I need help. I can't. I'm getting really anxious. I'm having trouble sitting still. And the baby music is making me really anxious as well. I have PTSD and it reminds me of something. No worries, Amy. If you need to, feel free to log off. 
uh, we're almost done here anyway. So if you want to hop to your smaller groups early, feel free. Okay. So Sharndeep, did you say remove the instance? Yeah, we remove the instance from this test, right? Test cat's name gets set, right? And we set there in the before annotation and in this method, right? Um, well, let's go through just to make sure that I'm hop I'm, I'm understanding. So we have our cat. My question is if we want to create a new test like this um, cat's name gets set, right? And if we want to create a new test and and then we don't need to create an instance over there too because we already set in the before. Correct. Um, yes, absolutely. So this instance will be built every time before a test runs. So a new cat will be built for every test. But only for the class, cat s class, correct? C correct, yes. Only while this particular list of tests are being ran. So oh. if we have dog tests, we'd have to build the scanner over there and so on. Absolutely. Completely different test, completely different right. class, completely divided. Absolutely right. But in this class, we just have to create one time before and we can create number of tests underneath and we don't need to create the instance again, right? Correct. As long as the instance doesn't need to change. Okay. So if you needed a test with the, the cat name as, as like ball or something like that, Mm -hmm. then you'll need to you'll need to adjust it within that test you'll yeah. need to build the instance within that test to be specific for the situation <laughs> great question all right anybody else have a question we have one more minute um, how, how did you get those libraries in there the ham question j unit so go ahead and re watch the recordings what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to create that lib folder you drag and drop the jars into that lib folder and then you right click on the jar and you press add as, uh, it's not on here, but you say add as library. But well, where we did through, you drag them from? Uh, I believe they're downloadable online. I don't exactly know where they are at, but you shouldn't need to do this. I was just showing you the manual way, but your, your repository should always ha already have them included. Okay. Oh, why would you, it, because it looks like that you would be making extra code when you do a before and after versus putting everything into tests. What would be the actual benefits of creating a before and after versus putting everything under uh, test? Just basically, <coughs> any you don't want to duplicate code. So mm -hmm. if you have something that you're doing every single test as it winds up, that's what goes into before. So if you have to create 18 instances of dogs, 18 instances of cats for a, because you're testing out a pet store for whatever reason, you don't want to do all, you don't want to have 18 lines of code in every single test. So if I had cat one through cat 20, every single test is going to have to instantialize 20 cats. So that means it's 20 lines of code per 200 tests. It's 2000 lines of code, unless you just put that 20 lines of code, and one before, you're saving yourself a lot of time and a lot of effort. So you can kind of look at like test as like a function and before as like uh, calling the function? But think of before as prepping before the test. So it's okay. something that's like, all right, I'm going to get things ready. I'm going to set out the paper, set out the pencils. And then the test actually runs through it and does everything. And then after, you take, you clean up the pencil, you clean up the paper. So exactly. I would say more along those lines, if we're talking okay. about analogy. Hi, I have a question real quick. Yeah, sure, Regan. I know you did assert equals, but there's also assert true and assert false. Can you do a really quick example of that? Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, let me see what I can do here. So let's say that the cat name, um, say so and so this one will say cat name is not null or something like that so what we do is assert uh assert true which means is my thing actually true so what i would do is like okay is actual oh i gotta import it excuse me so 
Sorry, more tests. I apologize. This You're all good. I'm just going to import everything. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So it's just going to take in one parameter there. Um, so it's not null. So what we would say is like, okay, if I is not null. So I would say actual is not equal null. So that will return a Boolean. Oh, I'm in JavaScript mode. So if we run this, it's it's just testing out a conditional. So assert true means, okay, is this thing inside of here true? Okay. <clears throat> oh, I ran only one of them. And a false just checks if it's false. So I, I apologize in, the, in that small amount of time, I didn't really have anything good. But if you're like, if your methods are returning a Boolean, say you're doing uh, is dog or is cat or is pet or something like that, it's returning a Boolean, yeah. assert true and assert false would be what you want to use. If you need okay. to, compare strings, you do assert equals. Um, if you need to compare two objects or two classes, that's where things get a little bit trickier. You're gonna wanna do more deep comparisons, which we'll talk, we can talk about in the future. Cause I don't think you actually need a deep comparison in JUnit stuff. But it looks like both of those passed. So does that kind of help? Yeah, no, I just wanted to see an example. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you guys wanna save your time uh, on importing everything, Technically, you can just put the asterisks right there, so you don't have to say assert equals, assert true, assert false, blah, blah, blah. You can just assert, you can just get everything out of the package by putting the asterisks. All right. Anything else? Any final questions? All right. In that case, everyone, we are all done. Air high five. You made it through unit testing. Bam, right? All right, thanks everybody. Thank you for sticking through it. Enjoy your studio tonight. Um, the recording will be up there, hopefully at 8.15 as always. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Other than that, have a fantastic weekend. Enjoy that weather. Enjoy summer-ish while it's still here. And maybe we'll even get our one week of uh, fall in this weekend. Who knows? All right, have a great one everybody. Enjoy your small groups.